pictures. That was so good it made me take my shoes off. <laughs> Y'all have my shoes off because that was so awesome. Y'all, that song, I mean, you just think about the years, over the years, you've sung it, you think about the different seasons that you've been in and that you have sung those words. You thought about that before? Yes. I can think about hearing those words as a child, for sure. But I think about all the different seasons that I have been in and had to stand with assurance that this may be happening, but it is well with my soul. And here I stand tonight in this season. Whatever may come and whatever may pass, right? It is well with my soul. I pray that whatever season you find yourself in, that you can sing the words of that song. Amen. It is well with my soul. And take your shoes off when you get up. <laughs> There's a little bit of freedom when your feet start sweating as your shoes off, you know? And so it was like the spirit was just really uh, affirming and assuring that for some of you tonight that you're good. He's got you. Anybody need that tonight? Yeah. 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 He was just saying, yeah, we're good. I got you. I'm thankful for that. Well, we have been in this awesome series uh, that has us in 2 Timothy 1.7. And this has been a series of power, love, and sound mind. And it's been incredible. We have done power two weeks ago. We did love last week. And tonight we are in sound mind. And I can't think of a better song to bridge into this message than it is well with my soul. Because if you're just not real sound on some things, just go back to that. Go back to that. It is well with my soul. Well, let's look at the passage that this, um, this series has been founded in. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And uh, we've talked through different things each week, but today I kind of want to wrap up the last few weeks before I move into sound mind. One of the quotes or one of the things that the Lord gave to me is truly, and we all know this, as long as we allow the spirit of fear to be our source, it will be. So stop giving yourself permission to operate from a spirit of fear. Because as long as you give yourself permission to operate right there, you will. So as long as we allow the spirit of fear to be our source, it will be. And then I saw this quote this week. I have no idea who the author is. Of all the liars in the world, sometimes the worst are our own fears. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Yeah. Bob Goff says, fear always looks like it's going to win up until it doesn't. Yeah. Don't let it win. As long as you allow it to be the source, it will be. Don't give it permission. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. That's a little bit on fear. How about power? Let's look at power. A couple weeks ago, that first week was so good, so strong. We talked about power. Dunamis, dynamite, dynamic power that God gives in this passage. That's the type of power it is talking about. A, sorry, it's not self-control, self-discipline, prudence, temperate, and sober-minded. Power is dynamic dunamis. It is, a, it is, a, it is a, a source of power that comes from God. It can only come from God. That is for, that is for sound mind. That is cheating. What is up there? I'm giving you the, 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 the notes before we get to sound mind. But listen up. Power, dynamite, dunamis, and dynamic. I loved that night so much. You may remember that we talked about how God's power, the source of his power, comes in different ways in different seasons. And this quote, you remember, dunamis power remains through mountains and valleys. It just looks different at the top than it does at the bottom. Remember that? And we talked about the difference between, like, Samson, who had this dynamic power, right? Who could tear down the pillars and have this dynamic power, this resurrection power that is this unleashing of this, this might, if you will. But then also the amount of power that it took the woman with the issue of blood to just barely reach. And they're both... Dunamis. 
Or if it talks about God being the lion, Jesus being the lion and the lamb. The mighty God and the Prince of Peace. That they're both doing us. And that sometimes it just looks different, but he is the source. And sometimes it's a shout, and sometimes it's a whisper. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. And we're going to skip two to two slides to um, the quote on love. This is agape. And we talked about the agape love of God and how this is, again, this type of love can only come from the source, which is the Lord. And if we are a child of God, then this quote, as a child of God, we operate from love. Instead of fear, we operate in our true identity. And so that spirit of fear that wants us to operate, let that be our source. We're not operating in our true identity. We were not created in fear, were we? We were created by God in the image of God, and God is love. And so when we operate from agape, rather than fear, we operate in our true identity. You are edified in your spirit when you do that. This passage, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you agree, if you know all the answers, if your opinions are perfect, if everyone knows what you're against or what you're for, no. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Amen. This spoken to incredible um, young men and mostly also women that were learning how to follow Jesus. And they had been good Jewish boys and girls, and they knew that they were good Jewish boys and girls because they followed the law to the T, right? Well, Jesus says before this, a new command. And so he says, this is a new law. The new law is love. Mm -hmm. That's how they'll know that you're my disciples. Yes. All right, let's look at Psalm 9 tonight. So far, this most, this is going to be self-control, self-discipline, prudence, temperate, and sober-minded. I love this breakdown that I'm going to share with you here in just a second. Um, there's a phrase here that I, you're going to hear me say it a lot because I just love it. We'll get there in a second. But sound nine. Let's look at that. Inner outlook. This will come from the strong concordance, which regulates outward behavior. Safe, sound, if you will, because moderated. So this is an inward outlook. I love that, right? Because it's mod the safe, sound way, because it's moderated. Referring to what is prudent, because correctly, divinely balanced, if you want to correctly balanced, you would say divinely balanced, which is far more than being the middle of the road. I love that. I, I just, I want you to get here. This divinely balanced, that's what, that's the phrase I'm going to go with later, but, which is far more than being middle of the road. Uh, maybe some of you tend to be a person that doesn't like to rock the boat. That does not necessarily mean that you are operating with a sound plan. That tendency to not rock the boat might be rooted in fear that if the boat rocks, we're going to sink. Sound mind. It's far more than being just middle of the road. Sound mind. True balance is not one size fits all. Nor is it blandly static. Biblical moderation describes a man who does not command himself, but rather is commanded by God. Man, male or female, we know, right? I love that. Biblical moderation describes a man who does not command himself, but rather is commanded by God. Again, divine balance. This root, sophro, semis, then reflects living in God-defined balance. Once again, not a spirit 
of fear driving your moderate thought process, driving your safe soundness of mind, but a God-defined balance. Which I believe, if I can once again, say is rooted not just in who he is, but who I am in him. So that God-defined balance comes in not just knowing who he is. I know who my daddy is, but also that I am his. And his eye is on me. And so if I know who my daddy is, my God do my balance comes when I know who he is, and I know that I am his. Amen. And so the spirit of fear is not directing my steps. I trust that he's counseling me with his loving eye on me. Mm. I believe that's where we can find a God to find balance when I don't understand why life goes this way. But I know who you are, and I know that I am yours. And you have me. And you believe me. And I won't take the next step unless you say so. But my steps aren't just to be taken because you say so, but they're going to go in the direction of your will. Because I know who you are, and I know that I'm yours. And I can wait right here for your next instruction. But God defined balance in my decision making, in my belief of who I am, in my seasons, it is well with my soul. Amen. Divinely balanced. Here are some passages that have been for me over the years since I started memorizing scripture. And since I started really digging into the Word of God, when I came back to the Lord, or came all the way to the Lord, maybe for the first time in my 20s, on my bathroom floor, um, just being God, and I started researching what was true about me and the Word of God. Because any God that would find that broke down, drunk girl in a bathroom can have me. All of me. Can forgive all that? You can have me. All of me. You can make her now. You can have me. But I gotta ask you some things. Is it true that I'm worthless? Is it true because I was living through filters that were so destructive, that were placed on me by the enemy, by other people's labels, and by my own? And so I began to do research in the Word of God to find out who, the, what the truth was of who I was. And of course, I went digging through scripture to see if I was worthless, to see if I was a lost cause, to see if I was stupid. Matter of fact, this passage is one of the ones that I really came to when I was like, am I stupid? And I was told that I had a sound mind. I was thankful. This passage, I was 23 years old. Thankful. Just remember that. But... Through that season, when I started memorizing scripture and placing on truth and trying to find out what was true about me, I, of course, learned all that I could learn about God in that season, and I'm still learning about him. Amen? Mm -hmm. How many years later? I'm almost 50. But here's some ones that helped me keep my balance in a season of discovery of truth of not just who he is, but who I am in him. So here's some scripture. If you want to take some pictures, I would encourage you to do that or write this down. That will help keep balance as life comes and as life goes. Psalm 27, 13. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Come on. Sometimes it gets really not good. But I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Feel like your back is against the wall? This will help you keep your balance. Romans 8, 35, 37 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And this is an important passage. Because if you feel like, 
okay, I know that Jesus died for me, and like John 3, 16 says, for God to love the world and gave, but what I've done and, and what has happened and what is happening is so ugly and brutal and sinful that there's no way he just read, like, that he really loves me and that there's no separation in that. There's no way. And we will really talk ourselves out of believing the love of God is for us. And that he's a right here, right now God. We will talk ourselves out of believing that he is right here, right now for me. Because we see our sin and we magnify our flesh rather than magnifying his love. So the question is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Or trouble? Or hardship? Or persecution? Or famine? Or somebody else? Or me? Or this? Or that? And then 37, no. And all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Here it is. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Write it somewhere. I am convinced. Amen. Stop convincing yourself otherwise. You're wrong. <laughs> I am convinced that he loves me. I'm convinced, and that gave a lot of left and right, up and down, and east and west and north and south, and it gave us every direction that we look to find it true that God doesn't love me, and I can't find it right here. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, okay, that took care of that, neither angels nor, okay, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, I mean, it takes us every direction, and we just can't find it. God loves me, God loves me, God loves me, God loves me, nothing can separate me from his love. Otherwise, that will help you keep your balance on a day when the enemy wants you to be convinced. But I want you to remind him, I have looked east, I have looked west, I have looked north, and I have looked south. And I am convinced that nothing shall separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus my Lord. That helps us keep our balance. I could never walk the tightrope. I'd be like, what's that over there? <laughs> right? There she goes. <laughs> Philippians 4. Keeping our balance here. Anybody ever have a battle of the mind? Raise your hands. Okay. Beautiful. All right, this is for you. Philippians 4. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Let's stop right there. I sat with a lovely young lady in years past and even in years present, and we just listed it. Okay, I just want you to write this down. Write the word true. Write the word honorable underneath that. Underneath that, my bright. Underneath that, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and worthy of praise. So just make that list. And now we're going to go back to the top. I'm going to answer these questions. <coughs> I want you to answer what is true. This is a beautiful, life giving, balancing exercise. For the mind that gets caught in a loop of what is not life-giving. It is simple. And you can do it. So fix your thoughts. So choose what you're going to fix your thoughts on. Because sometimes we get really fixed on things. Amen? Yeah. But let's choose to fix our thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. This is divine balance Amen. for the mind. You can do that this week in your own devotional time. That would be good. That would be good. You've heard of Matthew 6, 33 and 34. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself, right? Tomorrow has no worries of its own. Well, this is from the translation of the message. I'd like to share it with you. I love these two passages from the message. 
Steep your life in God reality. God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. Anybody have FOMO in here? <laughs> You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. For the person that suffers, fear of missing out. I love this. Don't let that spirit of fear, and I know it's kind of a fun, trendy thing to say, but don't let the spirit of fear really actually live there and like build a house there. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Plain language, I love that. How about 34? Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. This is for those that really lose their balance in the moment when they're thinking 20 steps ahead. Anybody? Yeah. They've already decided how it's going to go. Yeah. And it probably won't go that way. And we know that. So this is for the people that really take those 20 steps ahead. And you're missing this moment right now of trust in this, and building this trust reflex, this trust muscle inside of your being with the Lord. That I don't know how that's going to go tomorrow, but I know that right now you're calling me to trust you. And we talked about the fear reflex this week, but this is an opportunity to strengthen that trust reflex or that trust muscle. And so it says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Does anyone know that that is true? He always does, y'all. He always does. He's so faithful. Psalm 23, 1 from the New Living Translation. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. When we pine for more, when we think that our, our settledness, we talked about this on Tuesday, women's group, incredible discussion last Tuesday. We think that our settledness will be when, right? When this is settled, or when this happens, or when we have, or when... I mean, we've all done it, fill in the blank. We think our settledness is on the other side of. But this would kind of would go well with uh, Matthew 6, 34, to see what God's doing right here, right now, and just to be able to settle it, that Lord is my shepherd, right now I have all that I need. So this would be a really good divine balance scripture, and, and it's really familiar. Don't miss it. A lot of times the familiar, we just say it. We just go on, right? But the familiar is some of the most essential. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. A great passage to check our balance when we are tempted to believe we'll be settled when. Psalm 77, 11, if you know, you know. But then I recall. All you have done, O oh Lord, I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. Oh, to check our balance in the still of the night when we've woken up and it is 3 a.m. and it is dark and no one's awake and we don't want to call or text anybody because this would not be the hour to do so. But my mind is racing and is he going to come through this time? Lord, are you going to come through this time? Because it seems like you're not going to. It is 11.50. Well, you know, he's at 11, 59, 59 sometimes. But you listen, we have those 3 a.m. moments when we're like, where are you? I haven't read in the Bible where you did this yet. I haven't read where you came through like this, and my need is this, so are, maybe, maybe you don't do this. Where are you? Oh, if you guys would take time in Psalm 77 this week, it's an incredible passage of honesty and also realization of who he is. Because about verse 11, he goes from like, have you just taken my joy? Have you taken the light? Remember the times we used to sing the songs of the night? You were good and you were God and I was yours? Well, where are you? That's paraphrased, of course. So verses 1 through 10 are just this, where are you? What's happened? 
And then verse 11, he remembers. The psalmist remembers. And the psalmist says, but then I recall all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. Divine balance. My eyes are once again on the center of my being. You've got me. You've got this. You'll counsel me with your loving eye on me. I trust you. Amen. I don't have to like what I'm going through. But I know all you've done. And I won't forget. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. This passage is interesting because it's basically telling the Israelites when they are literally up against the Red Sea and the Egyptians barreling down barrel with Pharaoh and all the chariots and all the armies and all of that, right? And they're really between a rock and a hard place. And Moses spends some time with the Lord and comes back to tell them, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Just before this, he said, we're going to see deliverance. But he's telling them to be quiet. Now, I'm not saying anybody in this room is would do this, but sometimes when it gets really hard, kind of like the last one, we're like, God, 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 don't you see me? Don't forget me, don't forget me, don't forget me. I know you're helping them find a parking spot, but don't forget my need. <laughs> what about me? What about me? What about, me? What about, me? What about us? We're going to die out of here. Right? It goes hand in hand with this last one we talked about. But Moses spent some time with the Lord and relays this message that the Lord will fight for you. You need only to shh. Let him do it. Let him do it. And we had a women's retreat back in September. It was a great time together. Great time together. And um, one of the things we talked about was when they got quiet because uh, Moses had told them in verse 13, today you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you. All right, so now I read that and I'm like, they're about to see something. Well, you know they're facing the army, right? Because we do that. We face, and I think Paige Books even said this, we face what's the attack a lot of times. So you know they're facing the army coming at them because the Red Sea is back here and they would never just think, well, I've seen the waters part before. Let me just, they never seen that. They didn't know that could even happen. So you know they're facing the army and he's like, you're going to see the deliverance of the Lord. And then he says, shh, God's going to do something. Shh. And what I love is by telling them to be quiet and open your eyes, and those two verses, they got to see and hear the waters part. Sometimes, if we'll just shh, watch, listen, we'll find our balance in the waiting. Because we're prepared and postured to not just experience the miracle, but literally, physically, possibly see it and hear it. And I don't know about you, but when God does something, I don't want to miss a sense. I want to taste it. And so this is a balancing moment to remind me, shh, watch, listen. The Lord will fight for you. You might just hear it. Hebrews. 1023. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Oh, don't let go, friends. When the battle of the mind and the battle of the heart and the spirit of fear and the things that are coming left and right and the storms of life and everything is rising in the Red Sea and the army and the middle of the night, all the things, don't let go. Don't let go. Hold on swervingly to the hope of profess because he who promised is faithful. Amen. You can find a divine balance the fact that he is faithful. Not everyone is not everyone is faithful, but God is. And one of my personal favorites and very dear to my heart in the last seasons is Isaiah 43 too. 
When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Now, what's the first word of this passage? When. Say it again. What's the first word? When. Yeah, it doesn't say if. It's hard, y'all. So this is when we do. Because we will. Right? So we, we don't know what that's going to look like. We don't know what waters and fire and rivers will take shape as. Right? But we're going to. So when we pass through the waters, his promise is he will be with us. And when we pass through the rivers, the promise is they will not sweep over us. And when we walk through the fire, we will not be burned. Why? Because the flames will not set us ablaze. This was a very uh, important passage of scripture for me recently. Many of you know my journey with cancer. And this was the very first passage the Lord gave me after my diagnosis. And I have an image. I made images throughout my entire cancer journey as a creative outlet for um, my cancer journey. I'm going to one day eventually make them into greeting cards and then send them to people. But I have images throughout that whole journey of scripture and song lyrics and um, quotes that I, that I gathered throughout that time. This was the very first passage that the Lord brought me to after my cancer diagnosis when it was initially looking very grim, very difficult. And because we stand on the other side of it, a beautiful miracle where the Lord has done a huge work, and we all, most of us know the story where it um, started out really terrible, ended out really great, with a, with a miracle in the middle of God doing an impossible, beautiful, uh, peculiar miracle, if you will. I'll tell you another time. But through that journey, especially those first few weeks and months, uh, especially the first few weeks. The spirit of fear, as you can imagine, felt like it had a free pass at my brain. And if you've been diagnosed with a severe illness or you've gone through something really tumultuous, you understand that spirit of fear really feels like it just has permission to just come on by every day. And I felt like I was playing dodgeball with these fearful thoughts. I was dodging them. But some of us are better at dodgeball than others, right? And so I really felt myself just constantly dodging this, this, these fearful thoughts. And it got worse and worse as my doctor's appointments continued to compound because the information just kept coming. And I was still dodging. I was, and every now and then it hit, hit me upside the head, you know? And I'd have to deal with that and battle that and dodge some more. And I was working hard at dodging that with the Lord, only by His strength, I believe. But there came a point where I got to be honest with you, that was exhausting. That was exhausting. The fatigue that I was feeling just from constantly dodging the thoughts, right? Let alone the doctor's office and the, and the appointments and the scans and all the information and also being a pastor and not wanting to stop my life, wanting to believe that God's going to take care of me, but constantly dodging. I mean, it was, it was fatigue. It was absolute fatigue. Brain fatigue. And for everything. And cancer is just really noisy anyway because it's just like, you have cancer, you have cancer, you have cancer, you have cancer. I'm like, shut up, I know, right? So that fatigue bothered me. I don't like mental fatigue. That's where we start losing our balance. And I wanted to keep my eyes on the Lord through this journey like none of them before. And so one day I decided that I was going to, strangely enough, have lunch with fear. And I sat down with a cheeseburger, and french fries, and a Coke at none other than McDonald's. And a napkin and a pen. And I decided to just go ahead and say, all right, tell me. Ask all the fearful questions you have. Ask them. Speak the words. Tell me the worst thing you want me to believe. And I would, I would caution you to do that if you tend to battle a spirit of fear, but I had to do it that day. 
And I sat down and I listed out every fear, every fearful thought, every what a question. The most severe, the most simple. And then when I had enough of that, I said, okay, you're done talking now. It's my turn. And I began to answer and speak scripture back. There were some I couldn't answer. There were some that you could put scripture to, like death. Well, you know, Jesus rose again. He makes all things new. Death, where is your state? But still, what if I die? And so that became like a layered question because it wasn't just about my eternal soul, it was about my husband and my children and grandchildren that I hadn't even met yet. And you guys, and my friends. And so I, I took the layers apart and I began to decide, okay, death is possible. I don't think it's about the plan, but I think death is possible here, right? And so I began to prepare myself for some of the what ifs rather than just pretend like they couldn't be true. They couldn't be possible, if you will. And so that day, instead of letting fear determine my mindset, I answered some really hard questions and I prepared for the what ifs. And then I told fear, you're done here. You're done here. And every time one of those what ifs would pop back up, I say, yeah, we've already answered that question. One of the things I was prepared to do in that meeting was to write a letter to my family. But what if you die? What if your mouth sores are so bad you can't even talk at the end? You can't even tell them what you want to tell them. Thank you for the reminder. I'll write them a letter now. And so I wrote letters to my family. I wrote letters to you. I wrote a letter to you, this church. And I wrote a letter to the world in preparation that the mouth sores would get so bad that I wouldn't be able to speak it. So if. But I didn't want fear to take that from me and say, oh, that would never happen, that could never happen. I wanted to be prepared to tell the world, to tell my family, that Jesus has been my joy. Jesus has been my joy all the way through. And they've been a great joy in my life, and they love my family. You know that I love my family, but my greatest joy has been Jesus. And I didn't want the spirit of fear to take that opportunity. And that if they find themselves in a season of lacking joy, and death can do that, look to Jesus. You know, there's some questions it's time for you to answer. And I would not visit the spirit of fear by yourself. I would sit with Jesus and I would answer some of those questions. You'll find that even smack dab in the center of a conversation with fear, that even there, Jesus will be your joy. And so on the day that I was having surgery and not dying, hallelujah, I modified those letters to my children and my husband, and I just sent them a little note. But even on that day, I had a portion of the letter that I had drafted that I could send them that was prudent on that day. I didn't have to come up with something laying there with an IV and the reality of a robotic surgery and who knows what they were going to find. I'd already been prepared, not because of fear, but because of a sound mind, a divine balance that met me at McDonald's and helped me kick fear to the curb. That one final dodgeball blow was not to me. It was to him. It doesn't mean that there wasn't more to dodge, right? It doesn't mean that there's not still more to dodge. But I'll never forget that McDonald's day. We're smack dab in the center of really some really good french fries. A 
I'm not sure it's meat, but a really good cheeseburger. <laughs> the best soda anywhere. And a conversation with fear. Jesus was my joy. I had divine balance. Because I had Jesus. I don't know that you want to face some of the fears. But I just want to encourage you, maybe just grab Jesus and some french fries and have a talk with some of these questions. Overcome some of these questions and maybe write some letters and prepare yourself for the what ifs, not because the fear needs to win, but because it's possible. I'm not going to say some toxic thing here and say it's not possible. It is. Some of the stuff is possible. Have you noticed the condition of the world? Really bad news is possible. But Jesus is my joy. But that doesn't mean I don't need to write a letter. That doesn't mean that I don't need to have a passage of scripture prepared on my mirror for the day that fear comes back like a dodgeball competition of some sort. But I want you to know this. Jesus will be my joy. And those things are still possible. And Jesus is still my joy. And we've seen cancer disappear here, okay? We've seen cancer disappear here. We're not, we're not, I'm not forgetting that. It's not lost on me, but it's gone for right now. And forever, I believe. But that's not where my joy lies. Are you with me? Yeah. My divine balance is in that outcome. My divine balance is in that Jesus is backed up in the center of it all. I pray that you will hear me there. And receive that for yourselves. And do with it as you please. Don't let the answers you're praying for be your balance. Yeah. Yeah. Find your divine balance in Jesus. And the fact that he walks with you and he talks with you. He's paved the way. Whatever comes your way, he's paved the way to walk it with humility and grace and strength and confidence. And love and peace. And he'll give wisdom as needed. He's good. May your joy be found, not even in your children. Oh, there's a lot of joy in those moments, isn't there? We had a lot of fun when they were growing up, and we're still having a lot of fun. But may your greatest joy be found in Jesus. You'll have joy with your children. You'll have joy with your spouse. You'll have joy in the moments with your friendships. We have a lot of joy together, don't we? We can have joy next week at the Fall Fest. But make your greatest joy be Jesus. Yeah. Not the outcomes that you pray for. So I want to lead you in an exercise. Can we do that? Yeah. Super practical. We're going to take a little journey through a passage of scripture. I want you to spend some time with the Lord, and I want you to consider right now one of the fears that you battle. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. So I want you to, we're gonna walk through an exercise right now of something that you battle. I want you to write this passage or take a picture. We're gonna be in 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. If you wanna write that down or take a picture of the next screen, go to the uh, two screens over. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11, right? So we're going to work through this passage of Scripture together. And what I want you to do is I want you to take a picture of this or write this down. And we're going to do it here tonight. But I want you to take it home with you. I want you to make time this week to do this by yourself in a more extensive way because we don't have the time here, probably. That day, I spent a lot of time. I threw, by the way, I threw that napkin away, okay? Don't worry. It's in trash heaven right now. <laughs> 
long time. But I wrote down all. I wrote down all the questions. Right now, we're just going to journey through one of your questions. Okay? So I want you to think of one thing that you really fear. One thing that comes back up with fear. One thing that is really this fear that you carry. And it could be anything. Okay? Just one thing. And then here's where we're going to start. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. So what we're going to do with this passage right here is I want you to not focus on your fear. I want you right now to close your eyes and I want you to start blessing the Lord for who he is. Bless him for who he is. In your heart and your mind, just bless the Lord for who he is. Speak some of his attributes to him. His power, his mind. And then tell him that you're his. And that you trust him. And you trust his timing. Next passage, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. Now in that same space, keep your eyes closed. I'll, I'll walk you through this. You can keep your eyes closed. You can keep them open whenever. Float your boat here. Now take that thing that you're thinking of, this fear, and almost like a bounty, and just hold it between two hands here, and identify it, and just push it toward him. Cast all your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. We've humbled ourselves. We know who you are, God. We bless you. We are yours. We trust you in your timing. I need you to take it. I don't want to try to control this anymore. I don't want to try to find the outcome for myself. I don't even want to face the attack. I want to be ears and eyes open for what you can do and the only way I can do that is to give it to you. I release it from my hands to yours. Maybe that's a person. Maybe that's a job interview. Maybe that's a relational situation with a loved one. Maybe what you're handing over is a financial need. Maybe you're really lonely and you're afraid that you're going to be alone forever. Fear can be so layered and so complex and make us believe that this is our forever. Just give it to me. Stay right there. Verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Now with your hands all in towards God, handing that thing over, I want you to recognize that you have a hand open, so just turn one palm over for what God wants to give. And I want you to put one finger up, preferably your pointer finger, towards the devil, okay? No. I'm going to live ready for what God has, what God gives, His timing. I'm going to be balanced in Him, but I'm not so middle of the road or far leaning that I can't see that the enemy wants to ruin this peace, take this peace. No. Yes to God. No to the enemy. If you feel him right now causing you to doubt that you can resist him, if you call, if you feel right now this like, what is the point of all this? Verse nine, resist him. <laughs> Standing firm in the faith, 
So right now, stay in your ground with the Lord. Tell him, I trust you. Tell the enemy to hush, that you trust the Lord. Tell the spirit of fear that you trust the Lord. That you trust him with the outcomes. Stand firm in your faith that you know who God is. If you have to go back to humbling yourself and blessing him and give it back to him again. Go back to the beginning if you have to. I humble myself and bless you, Lord. I am yours. I trust you with the outcome. I'm giving this to you. I have one hand open for what you have and one finger up at the devil saying no. I am resisting him and I am standing firm in my faith. And I love this next part of nine because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. I want you to hear this. You are not alone. You are not alone in this journey of overcoming fear and letting Jesus be the center of your joy. You're not alone in this. You're not the only one that's ventured this and you're not alone in it. So don't feel like there's something wrong with you right now. Just because you have this, this paramount of fear, if you will, this mountain of fear. No, there's nothing wrong with you. Believers all over the world are suffering too. And now, verse 10, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Let's say that again. If you'll just throw both palms out and receive this blessing. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself, himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and and steadfast. I don't know about you, but nothing makes us feel weak and unstable and like we're losing our balance, like fear. But no. Christ himself, God himself, the triune God of all grace, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. If you want to, just throw both hands in the air. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. To him be the power. I don't have to muscle this. I don't have to muscle this. To him be the power. I don't have to get the credit. <laughs> to him be the power. The person that's going to randomly send me the money. Thank you, but not to their glory. To him be the glory. To him be the power. When the answer comes, that's not where my power lies. No. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. I don't know if you took that journey with me. But I pray that you'll go back to this passage over and over again. <clears throat> and as you give it to him, you'll be ready to receive anything and not be naive enough to think that it ends there. The spirit of fear wants to overcome you. It does not want you to overcome it. Do this exercise if you will. And we end with two questions, as always. What is the spirit of fear telling you? And what is divine balance telling you? If you can identify those two questions and answer them, you get to choose where you find your balance. Will it be in what you can control? what you can figure out, what you need coming to you, or will it be in the divine balance, the source of the one who gives us a sound mind? Our God, our triune God. 
decide that your joy will not be in the answers. Decide that your joy will not be in the outcomes. Decide that your joy will not be taken from you, even if it doesn't go the way you thought it would. Decide that Jesus will be your joy. Decide that Jesus is your joy. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. As the worship team comes up, we're going to open up all of our response stations tonight. This is a good time to reflect on what we just talked about. You can come to this table and write down the journey you just took, that one fear. What is it? How are you going to give it to God? Write it down on this piece of paper. You're welcome to drop that in these baskets. You're welcome to take that home. Come light a candle. This symbolizes the light of the world, Jesus. That fear, that dark place, invite him in. Come light a candle as you light it. Jesus, light of the world, come into this fear. Come into this dark place. Help me to be open to all that God has and tell the devil, no, no, no. Maybe there's a person you're praying for. Maybe the greatest fear you have is you have a lost loved one. A loved one that doesn't know Jesus. Maybe it's a deep need. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe that great fear is some answers that you're waiting on. Over here, you can write that down on the masking tape with the Sharpie and tape it to the cross. And as you do, give it to Jesus and say, you will be my joy. You will be my joy. And as always, we open those stairs or the front row for you to come and kneel and pray. I'd like to have another layer and ask Eric and Laura to go to the back of the room. They will have anointing oil. And if you really find yourself in a spiral of fear and you really are ready to get out, go tell them they will anoint you and pray over you. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. And we've just taken a journey with him. And what he says about us and what he can do is too good to not believe. Let me pray. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for this journey. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this passage of scripture, this unique moment together. We've never done anything like that. But thank you, Lord, that you've done it tonight. You've done it in me. You're doing it in us. You're leading us to freedom. You're leading us out of fear and into more and more power, into more and more love, and into a divine balance that can only come from you. We know who you are, and we are yours. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Respond as you feel that. He's here.